Uh, thank you to the invitation to the organizers of this meeting. It's really been a pleasure to be here and hear about experiences from such a broad range of disciplines. And Mary and Andy did a fantastic job uh, providing all the background and context also on this great work being done on dengue and chingunia and Zika. So a lot of my talk will also focus on, on the work that we're doing on dengue and Zika, but I'm not going to give the background since we already had that. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I was doing some soul searching today and thought about when did I start thinking about climate and health. And I think when I was about 12 years old, I was in Ecuador with my family. My dad was on sabbatical. And that just happened to be the 1997-1998 El Nino. And so I think that's really when the seed started. You know, uh, For those of you, probably everyone in this room knows how devastating that was for, for Ecuador and other regions. Massive flooding. Uh, and the country this year with the major uh, risk of the El Nino the country was reeling, preparing for that. And so it's very fresh in people's memories. And uh, a lot of the work we're talking about, about dengue and Zika and chingunia, thinking about climate change. Um, as someone pointed out earlier today, I think El Nino is one of our classic case studies because it just creates such tremendous impact in the region. So my background's in ecology and public administration. And I've been with SUNY Upstate Medical University since 2012. So I'm going to step you through sort of the last 10 years of research on dengue in Ecuador, uh, our approach and where we are today, and then a little bit about going forward. And just to plant the seed, for the next session when we have this half hour of discussion, uh, what Rosemary and I had talked about was trying to start to create a conversation amongst this group about where are we going from here uh, as a group, as a consortium. And so what are those personal factors? What is really driving everyone? Why did everyone travel to this beautiful place in Aspen to spend this week together? So I will ask all of you to sort of think about that, and that's what I want to share in my talk. So really briefly, classical climate-sensitive infectious diseases. On the left, we have a, a photo that I took in the urban periphery of Machala, the study site that I'll talk about. This is the tube of water um, behind the houses built on the edge of the city. These are people's, this is people's water access, which is in the same place where all of the sewerage from the houses directly goes. You, know? you can understand that there's a high amount of vulnerability. Um, and through some of the work we did on cholera surveillance, we found high prevalence of cholera in the environment. This photo here is from a study actually that we did with Mary back in 2008 in Guayaquil, which was one of the first studies we did on dengue in Ecuador. So it all began here with, with the links to NCAR and Mary, Mercy Borbor as well. And this is a photo we took in the kitchen of a household in the urban periphery of Guayaquil. And this container here is the household water storage and drinking and cooking. And you can sort of see there were markings on the side where the Ministry of Health came to inspect it. And it was positive for Aedes aegypti larva. So we have the focal breeding site and risk source of risk for dengue transmission right in the household. And so as we think about climate and health, I always think about how do social conditions interact with climate to affect these health outcomes like cholera, typhoid, chikungunya, and Zika. And you really can't separate the two. And so my work has been focused on creating this long-term climate and health surveillance and research platform in southern coastal Ecuador. Um, our work has been built on a, I would say, a step-by-step -step approach through creating strong institutional partnerships with the ministries of health, with the National Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology, and a broad network of partners. Uh, my work as an ecologist has been informed from this social ecological approach to, to the studies. We've worked to strengthen these surveillance systems through ongoing training capacity building integration of data through spatiotemporal modeling. And the last piece I'll talk about is the service to, to improve the health of local communities. And of course, the goal of all of this, I think, at least initially, in this first phase, was to generate the evidence base for the effects of climate and health. You know, people, I think anyone who lives in these areas, any community member you talk to, clearly understands that climate affects their health. And if they understand that climate affects dengue and cholera. But as scientists, our role, my role, was to come in and provide that evidence. And then how can we use this information to inform and develop new public health interventions? So these, this is a panorama of our partners in country with whom we have formal partnerships up here on the left, on the right, and down here our partners in the US. And we work with a broad range of partners in many sectors. Um, to be able to do this kind of work, and I think to be effective, you need to be able to work and talk uh, across many disciplines and different sectors. This is something I always show students also when we think about what is global health and where might you see yourself in the global health arena. So from 2007 to 2012, uh, I began my PhD work in Ecuador. And a lot of this work, as I mentioned, was to 
establishes evidence base for climate and social ecological risk factors for dengue. And this work was done in partnership with the Ministry of Health and the National Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology. So throughout most of my talk, I'm going to be, I'm going to be focusing on the city of Machala, Ecuador, which is a, a city located right here, about an hour north of the Peruvian border, three hours south of Guayaquil. It's a port, it is a port city located along the Pan American Highway of about 250,000 people. So it's a major, uh, it's a very important place for surveillance because you have a lot of movement of people and goods. And it's dengue is hyper endemic. Since the early 2000s, all four serotypes have been co-circulating. In 2015, chikungunya emerged, and this year, uh, Zika emerged. The first cases were confirmed in February. Ecuador, for those of you who don't know, is right here, sandwiched between Colombia and Peru, located on the equator. Uh, we have year-round dengue transmission, although strong seasonality that tracks the rainy, the hot rainy season, and also very affected by El Nino events, as I mentioned before. So in Latin America, some of the work that Angel Munoz's group and his team at IRI has done has shown that across Latin America, uh, most of the variability can be explained by interannual variability more so than long-term trends. And in this region, in, in coastal Ecuador, this interannual variability is driven by these El Nino events. The very first talk of today did a fantastic job, uh, our speaker, describing El Nino events and teleconnections. And so you can see here, this is a figure showing correlations between the Oceanic El Nino index and between October, November, December, and three months later, rainfall. And areas that are red are strongly correlated. So coastal Ecuador is strongly correlated with warming of the sea surface temperature. And if you looked at a, a graphic for temperature, it's very similar. So when you have El Nino events, warming of the sea surface temperature, we also have warming increases in, in mean air temperatures. And when we think about climate change, um, there are many uh, concerns that climate change will increase the frequency of extreme El Nino events. Uh, as I mentioned, that's one of the most important drivers of this interannual variability in rainfall. And so this study, published in Nature Climate Change in 2014, projected that the frequency of extreme El Nino events will increase from one event every 20 years to one event every 10 years. So you can imagine this has a tremendous impact on the people living in these areas. And as we all know, the world is getting warmer. And the work done by Angel Munoz and his group also showed, when they did this time series decomposition, that if you want to understand variation in temperature across the Americas, long-term climate trends were the most important com component. And so overall warming in the region was, was most important for Latin America. So in addition to increasing frequency of extreme climate events and warming, we also have urban demographic trends. As we're all aware, Latin America is one of the most urbanized places in the world. About 80% of the population live in urban areas. These are photos from Guayaquil, the biggest city in Ecuador. These are photos that I took. Actually, this photo was also when Mary was there. That's on the outskirts of Guayaquil. This is a photo at some of the new developments right on the waterfront. Very beautiful hotels. And so these are extreme extremes in, in living conditions within the same city. I think we see this probably throughout many developing countries. But if we want to understand health outcomes, we need to understand the social context. Of course, people living in this apartment building are not affected by climate events the same way as people living in the outskirts of the city. And so in this first phase of our research, we used a mixed methods approach or participatory methods, uh, a whole range of different methods. We started working directly with community leaders and engaging the climate and health sector. So that was a first step, was just to get everyone to sit down at the table together, which can be a major undertaking. Um, we did a range of entomological surveys, pupil surveys, uh, and OB trapping, household surveys, community focus groups, and spatial temporal analyses of existing climate and health data. So I call this all what bucket biology. This is all done basically without much funding, sort of without doing any major prospective cohort studies. We said, okay, what can we learn from the information that we already have and from doing simple surveillance studies. And so one of the first studies that uh, we did was in partnership with Rachel Lowe, who is a fantastic modeler, a uh, dengue climate expert who's at IC3 in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And Rachel and I met at a climate, what is it? Uh, the IRI used to put on these workshops called Climate Information for Public Health. And for those of you who attended them, they were fantastic. And so Rachel and I met, and within three days of meeting, we had put in our abstract to ASTMH to, to do what turned out to be this paper. So it was just this fortuitous uh, meeting. 
And with Rachel, we were able to look at 15 years of climate information and dengue data for southern coastal Ecuador and develop a model to understand the key predictors for climate and non-climate information. So we have Oceanic Nino Index, minimum temperature, rainfall, the number of dengue serotypes circulating in the country, and Aedes aegypti indices. And so we found that you needed to be able to look at climate and non-climate drivers to explain the variability in the region. I'm going to, I don't want to explain much about this, I'm going to go faster, but this is work done by Angel Munoz also to look at temporality and cycles of dengue and climate. And with Rachel's group, we're working to create better dengue forecasts building on these past modeling efforts. We also conducted those field studies that I mentioned, uh, entomological surveillance studies sur and surveys, focus groups to understand how climate affected dengue risk within the city. Participatory methods, working with community members to understand causal pathways, misconceptions, and roles of community and government. And all of this information came together so that we could begin to characterize what I understand as a social ecological system for dengue in this region. So it's important to understand that the social ecological system for dengue in Machala is not the same as Puerto Rico or Thailand or Kenya. And so having local studies to understand this dynamic is really important. And so in our study, we found you have these large-scale climate drivers like El Nino, local climate effects, rainfall minimum temperature, different things are happening during the dry and rainy season depending on water storage behavior, and different household and demographic risk factors come into play in each season. And so this is important if you want to inform public health interventions. So phase two, since I joined 2012, uh, under Rosemary's leadership also, she had begun the Center for Global Health in partnership with Tim Endy at SUNY Upstate. Uh, I had the, the opportunity to join the team to continue my work there. And so with support initially from the Department of Defense, we set up a study called Capacity Strengthening in Ecuador, partnering to improve surveillance of febrile vector-borne diseases. And this study um, has been ongoing since the end of 2013. I'm going to explain a little bit. I'm going to step you through the... The surveillance study has active and passive surveillance. We work with four sentinel clinics in the central hospital in the city. Uh, we have a network of microclimate sensors, which are the triangles. And this is providing high resolution longitudinal spatiotemporal data on a whole range of parameters, including human infections, so the clinical aspects, um, the virus serotypes and genotypes. Also, I should mention, we looked at Chagas, Dengue, Chingunia, and Sika, um, mosquito vector and infections in the mosquitoes, human nutrition, social ecological risk factors, microclimate. In addition, we've done several intervention studies to test new mosquito control devices that we're developing, um, and a study on environmental surveillance of cholera, which I'm not going to talk about, but I'm happy to talk about offline. Our work on, on dengue currently is being funded also through these NSF grants, through uh, an NSF Zika grant, uh, Zika Rapid Institute is the top one, and the second one, NSF NIH EEID grant, which is funding a three-year cohort study that we're in the process of launching um, with eye buttons, because someone asked about eye buttons, I made sure to pull up a photo here. I think that was Mary, right? So these are these cool little buttons that we're putting in all the households to measure temperature and relative humidity during this cohort study. And we'll have data on adult mosquito abundance, household risk factors, and dengue and Zika prevalence in humans and mosquitoes along an elevational gradient. Well, well it's not, a, not an elevational gradient so much as four different sites in different climate regimes at different elevations, but they're not, you know, it's not like a straight up gradient. And our, so our approach to doing integrated climate and health surveillance was recently profiled in this publication by the WHO and WMO, which has a series of, I think there's over 40 different case studies from around the world. So this is, I'm going to talk you through quickly our surveillance study. We work with, as I mentioned, Sentinel Clinics in the Central Hospital. So if a patient has a suspected dengue chingunia or Sika case, uh, our nurses are contacted. And there's a woman here under the mosquito net. And this is in the emergency room in Machala. This is our study nurse, Priscilla, and so she's doing the informed consent and with this woman who had a severe case of dengue hemorrhagic fever. This is from February of this year. We then go to the household of the index patient and we recruit anyone in the house who's willing to participate, in whether or not they have symptoms, and from four surrounding households. This was the husband of the woman who was hospitalized. And Priscilla here is taking anthropometry measurements and we collect a whole bunch of clinical information as well and we're looking at uh, anthropometry, anthropometry to look at nutrition risk factors. In the same household, this is the daughter of that family, our entomology technician collects adult mosquitoes using Procopac backpack aspirators, which we then maintain a cold chain so that we can look for the virus in the mosquitoes. 
and we collect a whole bunch of demographic information about the household and the members of the household. You can see here the husband looking at the mosquitoes that we collected in the house. This is from the Procopac. And this is also a great opportunity, of course, to speak to them, to share what, you know, information on dengue Zika prevention and to increase awareness. As I said, we repeat this in four surrounding households. So this is Priscilla in one of the neighboring households with a girl who entered the study. And the same, another household. And dengue and Zika and chingunia are major public health concerns in this region. So people in general have been quite willing and interested to participate in the study because we are also providing diagnostic results that may not be readily available through the Ministry of Health. I would say dengue has replaced malaria as the major cause of mosquito febrile illness here and in many places in Latin America. So jumping back towards the beginning, um, I, think we, I think many of you know that last there was a lot of fear about the El Nino this year um, and that the timing of that coincided with the emergence of Zika throughout the region. And so at the, the same days that this, when we were following this case with this woman who was in the hospital for Zika, we had one of the worst floods since the 1997-1998 El Nino. And over 170 millimeters of rain fell overnight, and it coincided with high tides, which caused major flooding throughout the whole city. And so you can just, I think this, I want to show you these photos so you can understand the social context of and sort of what people are living in these areas. So following um, the flooding and the Zika outbreak in Ecuador in, in February, at the same time as our surveillance studies were ongoing, in April of 2016, Ecuador had one of the worst natural disasters in the last 30 or 40 years. We had a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. And I say, what do earthquakes have to do with climate change? Well, it's not directly related to climate change, of course. But I just share this with you because I think it has really shaped my view about um, appropriate responses to natural disasters, which climate change is probably the greatest natural disaster that our generation is facing. And so when the earthquake hit, it devastated the coastal regions. Uh, about 30,000 people were outdoors. And these are in areas that are endemic, where Zika was emerging as an epidemic. You can see here photos from Bahia de Caracas, where we have been working since April. Major landslides that cut off some of the communities. People, uh, military people distributing water because we were without water for more than a week, and uh, up a lot longer than that, actually. But at no power for a week. And of course, very high risk for dengue, Zika, and chikungunya because you have no water, people are sleeping outdoors, and it's an area that's endemic. And so water storage, the risk of epidemics goes up. This was a report in a uh, newspaper in Montreal that documented that there was a 12-fold increase in Zika cases since uh, following the earthquake as well. You can see down here, women between 15 and 49 years of age are the worst affected by the virus. And so what did we do? We started working with the public health sector to mobilize uh, efforts to provide uh, medical services to the communities. I'm not a physician, but I know how to work with the ministries of health. And so by, through these partnerships, we were able to provide much needed medical care at that time, which to me was a moral and ethical imperative, similar to a lot of the things that we've been talking about with climate change. We began to organize and work with community leaders who were just truly inspirational. And we had actually a group of CU and PH students who had been doing research with me all summer. And they came to Bahia and did service for a period of time. Joe Domachowski is a pediatrician, a PEDS ID doc from upstate, who was there working with us as well, as vol all as volunteers. Ismelda, who is a brilliant community leader. Joe, working with children in the community. Uh, Ryan and Dan, who are med students from upstate providing service in the clinic. We also did Zika education through Zika plays at the schools, because these are areas that were in the midst of a Zika epidemic. <laughs> yeah. These are Reese and Jai and Keith. These are CU and PH students. And for me, one of the most compelling pieces of this work, and I just I bring, bring this in as a reflection. From yesterday, we talked quite a bit about, well, a little bit at the end about mental health. And for me, the mental health aspects of this work, when you deal with natural disasters and trauma, has been the most compelling piece uh, of the work that I've seen with the communities. And so this, is, this was last week. We were working with a group of women in one of the uh, more, most disadvantaged communities and children, and providing them just with a space to share and to come together and to talk. So really powerful ways to 
deal with disasters and trauma and something I think we should think about in the context of climate change adaptation. These are the kids from that same group and women leaders who were there. This is the woman who was a really, really skilled therapist. She was doing what she called laugh therapy. But it was just incredible. And you know, I think that these sort of holistic approaches to health and well-being are something we should think about in the context of health and climate change as well. I'm going to close with, with this. So we talked yesterday also. I think we began the fir very first session we talked about the Pope um, and how we are all here for a reason, right? We've traveled all over from, I flew in from Ecuador. Many of you have come from other parts of the world. Why are we all here? You know, what is it about this consortium? Why are, is climate and health so compelling that has brought all of us together for this week? And here you can read the quote. It says, in the face of the emergencies of human-induced climate change, social exclusion, and extreme poverty, we join together to declare that human-induced climate change is a scientific reality, and its decisive mitigation is a moral and religious imperative for humanity. So I leave that quote to the group so that we can also open up a discussion and have this time to talk about why, wh what, do, what do all of you hope to see come out of this consortium? How do we make sure that this doesn't become just five days of wonderful research talks? I turn it over to Rosemary. Great. Thank you very much.